The Letters of Joseph Helene Number 3 To the Beloved People, the Inhabitants of the Town of Taunton Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Most endeared and beloved friends, I readily acknowledge myself a debtor to you all and a servant of all, and therefore I have sent to salute you all. My lines did fall in a fair place when the Lord did cast my lot among you. I remember the tears and prayers that you have sent me hither with. How can I forget how you poured out your souls upon me? And truly you are a people much upon my heart, whose welfare is a matter of my continual prayers, care, and study. And oh, that I knew how to do you good. Ah, how certainly should never a son of you miscarry. Ah, how it pities me to think how that so many of you should remain in your sins after so many and so long endeavors to convert. Once more, oh, my beloved, once more hear the call of the Most High God unto you. The prison preaches to you the same doctrine that the pulpit did. Hear, O my people, hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. The Lord of life and of glory offers you all mercy and peace and blessedness. O oh, why should you die? Whosoever will, let him take of the waters of life freely. What? Miss of life? When it is to be had for the taking? God forbid. O oh, my brethren, my soul yearns for you and my bowels towards you. All that I did but know what arguments to use with you. Who shall choose my words that I may prevail with sinners not to reject their own mercy? How shall I get within them? How shall I reach them? Oh, that I could but get between their sins and them. Beloved brethren, the Lord Jesus has made me most unworthy, his spokesman, to bespeak your hearts for him. And oh, that I knew but how to woo for him that I might prevail. These eight years have I been calling, and yet how great a part remain visibly in their sins, and how few have I gained to Christ by sound conversion. Many among you remain under the power of ignorance. Ah, how often I have told you the dangerous, yea, damnable state that such are in. Never flatter yourselves that you shall be saved, though you go on in this. I have told you often, and now tell you again, God must be false if ever you be saved without being brought out of the state of ignorance. If ever you enter at the door of heaven, it must be by the key of knowledge. You cannot be saved except you be brought to the knowledge of the truth. A people that remain in gross ignorance, that are without understanding, the Lord that has made them will not have mercy on them. Oh, for the love of God and of your souls, I beseech you, awake and bestir yourselves to get the saving knowledge of God. You that are capable of learning a trade, are you not capable of learning the way to be saved? And is it not pity that you should perish forever for want of a little pains and study and care to get the knowledge of God? Study the catechism if possible. Get it by heart. If not, read it often, or get it read to you. Cry unto God for knowledge. Improve the little you have by living answerably. Search the scriptures daily. Get them read to you if you cannot read them. Improve your Sabbaths diligently, and I doubt not, but in the use of these means you will sooner arrive to the knowledge of Christ than of a trade. Many have escaped the gross pollutions of the world, but stick in the form of godliness. Oh, I am jealous for you that you should not lose the things that you have wrought. For the Lord's sake, put on and beware of perishing in the suburbs of the city of refuge. Beg of God to make thorough work with you. Be jealous for yourselves and try your estates, but only with those marks that you are sure will abide God's trial. But for you that fear the Lord in sincerity, I have nothing but good and comfortable words. May your souls ever live. What condition can you devise wherein there will not be manner of joy unspeakable to you? O oh, beloved, know your own happiness and live in that holy, admiring, adoring, praising of your gracious God that becomes a people of his praise. 
The good will of him that dwelt in the bush be with you all. The Lord create a defense upon you and deliverance for you. The Lord cover you all the day and make you to dwell between his shoulders. I desire your constant, instant, earnest prayers for me and rest, a willing laborer and thankful sufferer for you. From the Common Jail, July 4th, 1663, Joseph Alain. Letter 4 To my most endeared friends, the servants of Christ, and taunt in grace and peace. Most dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown. My heart's desire and prayer to God for you is that you may be saved. I know that you are the butt of men's rage and malice. But you may satisfy yourselves as David and sustain and shimmy eyes curses. It may be the Lord will look upon our affliction and requite good for their cursing this day. But however that be, hold on your way. Your name indeed is cast out as evil. And you are hated of all men for Christ's sake, for cleaving to his ways and servants. But let not this discourage you, for you are now more than ever blessed. Only hold fast, and no man take your crown. Let not any that have begun in the spirit end in the flesh. Do not forsake God till he forsake you. He that endures to the end shall be saved. The promise is to him that overcomes. Therefore think not of looking back. Now you have set your hands to Christ's plow, though you labor and suffer. The crop will pay for all. Now the Lord is trying who they be that will trust him. The world are all for a present pay. They must have something in hand and will not follow the Lord when they are hazard and hardship in his service. But now is the time for you to prove yourselves, believers, when there is nothing visible but hazard and expense and difficulty in your Maker's service. Now, my brethren, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong. If you can trust in his promises now when nothing appears but bonds and losses and tribulation, this will be like believers. Brethren, I beseech you to reckon upon no other but crosses here. Let none of you flatter yourselves with dreams of sleeping in your ease and temporal prosperity and carry in heaven too. Count not upon rest till you come to the land of promise. Not that I would have any of you to run upon hazards uncalled. No, we shall meet them soon enough in the way of our duty without we turn aside. But I would have you cast overboard your worldly hopes and be content to wait till you come on the other side the grave. Is it not enough to have a whole eternity of happiness? If God throws in the comforts of this life too, I would not have you throw them back again or despise the goodness of the Lord. But I would that you should use this world as not abusing it, that you should be crucified to the world and the world to you that you should declare plainly that you seek a better country which is in heavenly. Ah, my dear brethren, I beseech you carry it like pilgrims and strangers. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your souls. For what have we to do with the customs and fashions of this world who are strangers in it? Be contented with travelers' lots. Know you not that you are in a strange land? All is well as long as it is well at home, I pray you, brethren, daily consider your condition. Do you not remember that you are in an inn, and what though you be but meanly accommodated? Though you fare hard and lie hard, is this a strange thing? What should travelers look for else? Indeed, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But now God has called you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. But remember it is your duty to love them even while they hate you and to pray for mercy for them that will show no mercy or justice. This I desire you to observe as a great duty of the present times and let not any soul forget their duty as to with evil to them that do evil to us and to please themselves with the thoughts of being even with them. Let us commit ourselves to him that judges righteously and show ourselves the children of the Most High who does good to his enemies and is kind to the unkind and unthankful. 
And what though they do hate us, their love and goodwill were much more to be feared than their hatred. Brethren, keep yourselves in the love of God. Here is wisdom. O happy souls that are his favorites. For the Lord's sake, look to this. Make sure of something. Look to your sincerity above all things. Let not any of you conclude that because you are of the suffering party, therefore all is well. Look to the foundation that your hearts be taken off from every sin and set upon God as your blessedness. Beware that none of you have only a name to live and be no more than almost Christians. For the love of your souls, make a diligent search and try upon what ground you stand. For it pities me to think any of you should hazard so much and let lose all at last. But when you, once you bear the mark of God's favor, you need not fear the world's frowns. Cheer up, therefore, brethren. Be strong in the Lord and of good courage under the world's usage. Fear not, in our Father's house there is bread enough and room enough. This is sufficient to comfort us under all the inconveniences of the way, that we have so happy a home, so ready a father, so goodly an heritage. O oh, comfort one another with these words. Let God see that you can trust in his word. Let the world see that you can live upon God. I shall share my prayers and loves among you all and commit you to the Almighty God, the Keeper of Israel, that never slumbers nor sleeps. Be your watchman and keeper to the end. Farewell. I am a fervent well-wisher of your temporal and eternal happiness. From the jail, July 24th, 1663, Joseph Elaine. Letter 5 To my most dearly beloved friends in Taunton, grace and peace. Most endeared Christians, my heart is with you, though I am absent. Dear fellow soldiers under the captain of our salvation consider your calling and approve yourselves men of resolution be discouraged with no difficulties of your present warfare as for human affairs i would have you to be as you are men of peace i would have you armed not for resisting god forbid but for suffering only you should resist to the uttermost striving against sin here you must give no quarter, for if you spare but one agag, the life of your souls must go for the life of your sins. God will not smile on that soul that smiles on sin, nor have any, any peace with him that is at peace with his enemy. Other enemies you must forgive and love and pray for, but for these spiritual enemies all your affections and all your prayers must be engaged against them. Yea, you must admit no parley. It's dangerous to dispute with temptations. Remember what Eve lost by partying with Satan. You must fly from temptations and put them off at first with a peremptory denial. If you will but hear the devil's arguments and the flesh's pleas, it is an hundred to one, but you are ensnared. And for this present evil world, the Lord deliver you from it. Surely you would need watch and be sober, or else this world is like to undo you. I have often warned you not to build upon external happiness and to promise yourselves nothing but hardship here. I'll still remember your station. Soldiers must not count upon rest and fullness, but hunger and hardness. Labor to get right apprehensions of the world. Do not think these things necessary. One thing is needful. You may be happy in the want of all outward comforts. Do not think yourselves undone if brought to want or poverty. Study eternity and you will see it to be little material to you, whether you are poor or rich, and that you may have never such an opportunity for your advantage in all your lives as when you seem to run the vessel upon the rocks. Set your enemies one against the other, death against the world. No such way to get above the world as to put yourselves into the possession of death. Look often upon the dust that you shall be reduced to, and imagine you saw your bones tumbled out of your graves, as they are like shortly to be, and men handling your skulls and inquiring whose is this. Tell me of what account will the world be then. Put yourselves often into your graves, and look out from thence upon the world, and see what judgment you have of it. Must not you shortly be forgot among the dead? 
Your places will know you no more, and your memory will be no more among men. And then what will it profit you to have lived in fashion and repute? One serious walk over a churchyard might make a man mortified to the world. Think upon how many you tread, but you know them not. No doubt they had their estates, their friends, their businesses, and kept as much stir in the world as others do now. But alas, what are they the better for all this? Know you not that this must be your own case shortly? Oh, the unhappiness of man, how is he bewitched and befooled that he should expend himself for that which you know shall forever leave him. Brethren, I beseech you lay no stress upon these perishing things, but labor to be at a holy indifferency about them. Is it for one that in his wits to sell as God his soul for things he is not sure to keep a day? in which he is sure after a few sleepings and wakings more to leave behind him forever, go and talk with dying men and see what apprehensions they have of the world. If any should come to these and tell them here is such and such preferments for you, you shall have such and such titles of honor and delights if you will now disown religion. Do you think such a motion would be embraced? Brethren, why should we not be wise in time? Why should we not now be of the mind of which we know we shall be all shortly? Woe to them that will not be wise till it be to no purpose. Woe to them whose eyes nothing but death and judgment will open. Woe to them that, though they have been warned by others and have heard the world's greatest darlings and death cry out of its vanity, yet would take no warning, but only must serve themselves too for warnings to others. Ah, my beloved, beware there be none among you that will part rather with their part in paradise than their part in Paris, that will rather part with their consciences than with their estates, that have secret reserves to save themselves whole when it comes to the pinch, and not to be of the religion that will undo them in the world. Beware that none of you have your hearts where your feet should be, and love your mammon before your maker. May the Lord of hosts be with you, and the God of Jacob your refuge. Farewell, my dear brethren, farewell, and be strong in the Lord. I am yours to serve you in the gospel, whether by doing or suffering. From the jail, August 31st, 1663. Letter 6 To the beloved friends of Flock of Christ in Taunton, Salvation. Most dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown... I must say of you as David did of Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me, and your love to me is wonderful. And as I have formerly taken great content, in that my lot was cast among you, so I rejoice in my present lot that I am called to approve my love to you by suffering for you. For you, I say, for you know I have not sought yours but you, and that for doing my duty to your souls I am here in these bonds, which I cheerfully accept through the grace of God that strengthens me. Oh, that your hands might be strengthened and your hearts encouraged in the Lord your God by our sufferings. See to it that you stand fast in the power of the holy doctrine which we have preached from the pulpit, preached at the bar, preached from the prison. It is a gospel worth suffering for. See that you follow after holiness without which no man shall see God. O the madness of the blind world, that they should put from them the only plank upon which they can escape to heaven. Alas for them, they know not what they do. What would not these foolish virgins do when it is too late for a little of the oil of the wise? But let not any of you be wise too late. Look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Beware that none of you be cheated through the deceitfulness of your hearts with counterfeit grace. There is never a grace but has its counterfeit, and there is nothing more common than to mistake counterfeit grace for true. And remember you are undone forever if you should die in such a mistake. Not that I would shake the confidence of any sound believer whose graces are of the right kind. Build your confidence sure. See that you get the certain marks of salvation, and make sure by great observing your own hearts that these marks be in you, and then you cannot be too confident. But as you love your souls, take heed of a groundless confidence. Take heed of being confident before you have tried. 
I would fain have you all secured against a day of judgment. I would that the state of your souls were all well settled. Oh, how comfortably might you think of any troubles if you were but sure of your pardons. I beseech you, whatever you neglect, look to this. I am afraid there are among you that have not made your peace with God, and that are not yet acquainted with that great work of conversion. Such I charge before the living God to speed to Christ, and without any more delay to put away their iniquities, and deliver up themselves to Jesus Christ that they may be saved. It is not your profession or external duties that will save you. No, no, you must be converted or condemned. It is not enough that you have some love to God's ways and people, and are willing to venture something for them. All this will not prove you sound Christians. Have your hearts been changed? Have you been soundly convinced of your sins, of your damnable and undone condition, and your utter inability to lick yourselves whole by your own duties? Have you been brought to such a sense of sin that there is no sin, but you heartily abhor it? Are you brought to such a sense of the beauty of holiness and of the laws and ways of God that you desire to know the whole mind of God? Would not you excuse yourselves by ignorance from any duty, and that you do not allow yourselves in the neglect of anything that conscience charges upon you as a duty? Are your very heart set upon the glory in and enjoying of God as your greatest happiness? Had you rather be the holiest and be the richest and greatest in the world? And is your greatest delight in the thoughts of your God and in your conversings with God in holy exercises? Is Christ more precious than all the world to you? And are you willing upon the thorough consideration of the strictness and holiness of his laws to take them all for the rule of your thoughts, words, and actions? And though religion may be dear, do you resolve if God assist you to go through with it? Let the cost be what it will. Happy the man that is in such a case. This is a Christian indeed, and whatever you be, and do short of this, all is unsound. But you that bear in your souls the marks above mentioned, upon you I should lay no other burden, but to hold fast and make good your ground, and to press forward towards the mark. Thankfully acknowledge the grace of God to your souls, and live rejoicingly in the hopes of the glory of God. Live daily in the praises of your Redeemer, and study the worthiness, excellency, and glory of his attributes. Let your souls be much taken up in contemplating his glorious perfection, and blessing yourselves and the godly portion you have in him. Live like those that have a God, and then be disconsolate if you can. If there be not more in an infinite God to comfort you than in a prison or poverty or affliction to deject you, our preaching is vain and your faith is vain. Let the thoughts of God be your daily repast, and never be satisfied till your hearts run out as freely, naturally, unweariedly after God as others do after the world. Farewell, my dear brethren. The Lord God Almighty be a protection to you and your exceeding great reward. Farewell in the Lord. I am yours in the bowels of the Lord Jesus Christ. From the jail, September 11, 1663. Joseph Elaine. This has been a selection of the letters of Joseph Elaine.